Good night, everyone, and welcome to our final debate. Please stand for the national song.
Standing as Joad Richardson and the study to the president open us the word of prayer. Good night. Let us pray. Dear God, thank you for bringing us safely to our last debate. Guide tonight's proceedings and let this debate help us make informed decisions as we vote this election year. Later, as we return to our respective dwellings, we ask your mercy to take us safely there. We ask your blessings, mercy, and guidance. Be with us always. Amen. Thank you. You may be seated. I'll now take this time to welcome our candidates for the night. Firstly, we have Mr. Artland Vanderpool of the AUF. Give me a round of applause, please. Secondly, we have independent candidate, Mr. Lanny Hobson. <laughs> Thirdly, another independent candidate, Mr. Sutcliffe Hodge. <laughs> and lastly, we have Mr. Kenneth Hodge of the Anglo Progressive Movement. As you may know by now, I'm Neil Gomes, the president of the Anglo National Youth Council. With me tonight, I have Ms. Marissa Harden Hodge of the Angola Youth Ambassador Corps. You can give her a round of applause. Okay. Nominees contesting the upcoming 2020 elections will be given a chance to debate several areas of sustainable development. These debates seek to allow candidates to appeal to young voters and express their plans to achieve youth development nationally. The 2030 Agenda for Sustainable Development, adopted by all United Nations member states in 2015, provides a shared blueprint for peace and prosperity for people and the planet now and into the future. At its heart are the 17 Sustainable Development Goals, SDGs, which are an urgent call for action by all countries developed and developing. In a global partnership, they recognize that ending poverty and other deprivations must go hand in hand with strategies that improve health and education, reduce inequality, and spur economic growth all the while tackling climate change and working to preserve our oceans and forests. Now our sponsors, firstly, the government of Angola. We have Flo, Aronel, Titanium Audiovisual, Johnson's Delivery Services, Pink Mako, and Ashley and Sons. You can give them a round of applause, please. <laughs> now Ms. Harden Hodge will give us the ground rules. Okay, the ground rules are, firstly, each candidate will be given three to five minutes to give an opening statement. Candidates will be given four questions from the ANYC on the Sustainable Development Goals. Each candidate will be given a maximum of three minutes to respond to the question. In this section, the candidate is only to refer to the moderator in his response. After the candidate has been given an opportunity to respond, a maximum of two minutes will be given to each candidate to rebut the stance of their opponent or share further information on the question or topic if so desired. Only in this rebuttal section are candidates allowed to respectfully refer to their opponents. After the initial four questions, questions will be fielded from the virtual and live audience. Questions must be posed to all candidates. Questions with hidden agendas or that may seem confrontational will not be asked. Each candidate will be given two minutes to answer each question from the audience, with a minute rebuttal if so desired. After the segment is completed, 
Candidates will be given three minutes to give a closing statement. If questions are not clear, kindly ask the moderator to repeat the question. Rules to the audience. To ensure quality debate, we ask the audience to respect all the candidates. Please place all phones on silent or turn them off. The audience is not allowed to applaud or make any kind of noise to interrupt the response of any candidate. Any audience member that insists on doing such will be politely asked to leave. Please remember that no one is allowed to go down into the public library, and we kindly remind you to please be respectful at all times. Thank you. So we'll go right into it. We'll have the opening statement. We'll start with Mr. Arthur Van Der Poel. Hence, the second question, the first question, sorry, we'll begin with Mr. Lanny Hobson. So, you may start. Thank you, Mr. Moderator. Members of the Anguilla National Youth Council, fellow debaters, audience, those present and virtual, good evening. I want to take this opportunity to thank the Anguilla National Youth Council for organizing yet another series of high quality debates. As a former president of the Anguilla National Youth Council myself, I'm sure you didn't know that, I can understand and appreciate the many challenges you might face in implementing such an activity. But you are doing an excellent job. My name, for those of you who might not remember, or might not know who I am, my name is Arthur Vanterpool, an island-wide candidate with the Angular United Front. And I'm under the symbol, the beacon, in 2010 to 2015, I represented district number one in the Angular House of Assembly. And uh, I did that with pride. As I approached the topic at hand, I recognized that in the year 2015, world leaders came together to focus on the future. But what they saw in their towns and cities was not good. They knew that things did not have to be that way. So the leaders created an ambitious 17-goal plan called the SDGs, or Sustainable Development Goals, designed to rid the world of extreme poverty and hunger, ensure healthy living and well-being for all, quality education, clean water, and sanitation, just to name a few. I implore my fellow debaters, and indeed all here and in the virtual audience, to see this exercise not only as a political debate, but rather an opportunity to advance workable solutions that would benefit all, especially our youth. I continue to pledge my, to pledge my support to the advancement of these targets for our people. In recent times, the global pandemic, our COVID-19, has exposed a number of our weaknesses as a people. As we move forward, I will continue to advance the area of food security through the promotion of sustainable agriculture and fishing. Two areas, these two areas have and will continue to play a pivotal role in our survival moving forward. An AUF government will continue to support agriculture and fishing, plus the many local business ventures associated with them. I look forward to your support and your vote as I strive to continue to work on behalf of all who call this rock, Anguilla, home. I thank you. Thank you, Mr. Vanderpool. Um, the driver of PD871, we're asking you to move your car, you're blocking someone. One more time, PD871. Okay, now we move on with Mr. Lenny Hobson. Good evening, Mr. Moderator. It's a pleasure to be here to speak and represent the Angular population. And it's also an honor to be sitting next to my scoutmaster, Mr. Arthur Vanderpool, and teacher uh, Ken, teacher Ken and next to my colleague, 
Mr. Sutcliffe Hodge. We are here to be able to defend those who are least among us, which are expressed in the development goals as reducing poverty. And in our platform, we are focusing on universal education, universal health, universal justice, and universal basic income. The key to reducing poverty is essentially to give money into the hands of the persons. And thankfully, the government recently would have signed with the UK government $100 million grant, which can be used now to set up a state pension. We would love for the state pension to be named after Mr. Kenny Mitchell, who was savagely murdered in the hotel industry, which is supposedly the main industry in Anguilla. So our goal here is to inform the population that we can do better than just tourism alone. We can tap into our culture to promote Anguilla as a top destination where education is respected for all and where education is provided free of cost regardless of political affiliation and regardless of family income. Likewise, healthcare is a right and it should be recognized for everyone as the pandemic has proven to us. We are all in this together and therefore we should exemplify those slangs or mottos into action. And that action could have been taken from 1998, but sadly, the government chose to take it away from the poor, which violates James chapter five. We must be our brother's keeper, and also as it states in James 2.27, pure religion before God and man is to keep yourself unspotted from the wall and to help those who are in need. These will be the fatherless and the widows. So in our platform, we always promote equality of women, especially black women, and we recognize the reality of history. Angola is a colony, and in colonization, we were taught to hate ourselves, and our mission is to restore pride, honor, dignity of Anguilla, and our ultimate goal, like Mr. Walter Hodge did back in 1967, is to make Anguilla a republic where we can be able to chart our own course and we are able to have the freed weed and in addition to that, creating a new form of economic diversification. In addition, God has blessed us with more than 200 nautical miles that we can properly use to our advantage and not allow the colonizer to use it for their advantage. So, it is indeed a pleasure to be here uh, tonight among my colleagues and of course my good Scout Master. And we are here not to debate, but to share in our ideas. This is not a fight, the fight belongs to the Lord and the fight is to help those who are the least among us and to ensure that a state pension will occur for everyone in Anguilla. And those words about being all in it together, we will truly put it into practice and no longer just be a slang. I thank you very much. Thank you, Mr. Hobson. You'll now hear from Mr. Hodge, Mr. Circle of Hodge. Madam Moderator, Mr. Moderator, and President of the Anguilla National Youth Council, fellow political candidates, Distinguished audience present and distinguished audience listening via electronic media. Pleasant good evening, everyone. Let me first congratulate the Anguilla National Youth Council for organizing and conducting these series of debates. If this last group of debaters does not mess up tonight, you will be credited with conducting a very successful series of debates. I think we're on track to do quite well. The Sustainable Development Goals can be put into two very broad categories. One, love, caring, respect, and dignity for humanity. Two, love, caring, respect for planet Earth and the universe. We have a duty of care to each other. Every human being 
has a right to be here and have a dignified and have a dignified standard of living. This is one of the greatest commandments of God. Love for our fellow human beings. As human beings living on this planet, we are merely stewards of this earth. Our responsibility is to take good care of this earth, enhance it in a sustainable way. We are only borrowing earth from future generations. So we are called upon in this sustainable development goal to protect the land and protect the sea. So the discussion here this evening is all quite topical as the world is challenged on many fronts as it relates to sustainable development. While we are here tonight focused on sustainable development on Anguilla, I know that you are consciously aware that in order to achieve these sustainable goals, there is a need to recognize our vulnerability and our global interdependency. COVID-19 is currently providing this. The United Nations launched the 17 Sustainable Development Goals in 2015, a time when we here in Anguilla were going through many challenges, a period when Anguilla was moving in a direction counter to the same SDGs, Sustainable Development Goals. As a matter of fact, conditions in Anguilla and the world have deteriorated even more since the onslaught of COVID-19 pandemic. As many of you will know, we made great strides at the turn of this new millennium. The year 2000 to the year 2007 thereabout, we made great strides. However, the period of 2000, however, let me just, the period, so there was a disturbance there, I, I'm, I'm sorry. The period when Anguilla moved, as a matter of fact, conditions in Anguilla and the world has deteriorated even more since the onslaught of COVID-19. As many of you will know, we made great strides at the turn of the new, new millennium, the year 2000 to 2007. However, the period of 2008 to present, our island is undergoing immense stress, economically and socially. We are still dealing with the challenges of the global economic downturn of 2007-8. We are still dealing with the challenges of the failure of our two indigenous banks, the National Bank of Anguilla and the Caribbean Commercial Bank. We are still dealing with the challenges of Hurricane Irma. We are still dealing with the challenges of coronavirus pandemic. All of these challenge, challenges go counter to the achievement of the Sustainable Development Goals. The discussion tonight will no doubt help to bring to light and bring clarity to some of the opportunities before us to move us in the path of realizing the achievement of these 17 Sustainable Development Goals. My colleagues on this panel, I look forward to our discourse. I thank you. Thank you, Mr. Sutcliffe Hodge. We will now hear from Mr. Kenneth Hodge. Good evening, one and all. To those of you present and those of you listening via radio and other forms of social media, my name is Kenneth M. Hodge. It is an honor to be here representing the Anguilla Progressive Movement as one of the four at-large candidates. I too take this opportunity to thank the National Youth Council for the initiative in raising the profile of the political conversation by means of these debates. I am delighted to be among my compatriots, Arthur Sutcliffe, and Dr. Hobson, as we all, in our differing ways, seek innovative solutions to move Anguilla forward. My presence here this evening, Mr. and Madam Moderator, is based on my own conviction that my time has come. In the words of poet James Lowell, once to every man and nation comes the moment to decide in the strife of truth with falsehood for the good or evil side. That moment where opportunity meets purpose 
a time when upon deep reflection, one questions how best to serve people and the nation. That time for me is now. I am a holder of a Master's of Business degree with distinction in public sector management and a seasoned public servant of close to 40 years. Coupled with my wider engagement in the Anguillian community in various organizations, such as the Anglican Young People Association, the Farrington Youth Club, musician organists in the Anglican and wider church community, this groundwork has placed me in good stead to seek elected office. This has been further cemented when one considers that I have served in various capacities over these years, including a certified classroom teacher, director of information and broadcasting, principal assistant secretary in the Ministry of Home Affairs, OECS commissioner to Anguilla, and most recently as principal assistant secretary, public administration, with responsibility for the public sector transformation exercise. In keeping with my sterling service as a member of the Anguilla Public Service, I would like to thank the governor's office for the confidence placed in me to lead the transformation process. While on this topic, let me state here that in short order after receiving our mandate from the Executive Council, I, along with my transformation team, had ensured that all the local and regional expertise were identified and put in place. Our efforts for overseeing and participating in an effective forward thrust, however, were regretfully frustrated due to a lack of allocated funds, zero dollars. So even though this exercise was agreed to, there was no political will, support, or finance to drive the process. The apparatus still remains in place, however, waiting to be implemented. This is one of the reasons why I am answering the call to higher service, to champion not only the further transformation of the Anguilla Public Service, but also transformation of our entire island. Moreover, while all of the SDGs are of seminal importance for us here in Anguilla and globally, I'm acutely and especially aligned with SDG 3, good health and well-being, SDG 4, quality education, and SDG 6, clean water and sanitation. One of the key indicators signaling success in meeting any or many of these SDGs, however, must hinge on our implementation of a national development plan. It is the full intention of the APM to provide this transparent roadmap developed with the organic and democratic participation of the people of Anguilla for our own sustainability and the prosperity of Anguilla's generations to come. In this age of advancement in all conceivable areas, we ought to leave our island home in every way better than we met it. That is why change certainly cannot wait. I thank you. As we began the opening statements with Mr. Vanderpool, we will now commence the questions with Mr. Hobson. Candidates will be given one minute to prepare, if so desired. The first question, is universal health care realistic within the next five years? What decisions must the government take to make this a reality? SDGs 1, 3, 10, and 11. I repeat. Is universal health care within Anguilla realistic within the next five years? What decisions must the government take to make this a reality? SDGs 1, 3, 10, and 11. The one minute begins now. If you're ready, Mr. Hobson, you can start. The answer is yes, it is possible to start it 
within five years. As a matter of fact, I've been continuing from 2014 when I came back from the United States. We came back to Anguilla to give the Anguilla people the best. Anything that we offer up, we always do our proper uh, research. So it is easy to accomplish, but they lack the political will because it did not personally benefit the politicians. When the politicians passed the Legislature's Pension Act, it was passed in a couple of days and they all agreed. $10.2 million for themselves. But when it comes to the people, especially the poor, they have no interest in it. Individuals who were supposed to be able to help it, they actively try to uh, sabotage. But on our own, we are still able to do more than 500 plus uh, free health checks, utilizing the skills of Dr. Lorenzo Webster too when he had his health fair. Also, Mr. John C. Lake, uh, POW. And we were showing the, the population and the government that the key to healthcare being affordable is prevention. Prevention is much better than the cure. So the cost will be less than $26.4 million, but a lot of the money is wasted in bureaucracy. This is the reason why if they read the act, the National Health Fund Act, which was passed on February 14, 2008, Valentine's Day, by the Anglo United Front government, when it was initially about to be set up, it was from 1998, when the leader of the AUF was also a member of the previous uh, coalition. So the only reason why it is not implemented is because I was not the person who had the Ministry of Finance and the Ministry of Health to ensure that it will be given as a right. Anything that is a fundamental human right must be given to the population. So the same way that we can find extra millions of dollars to be spent on prisons and also for the statutory bodies, they increase the outlay on the statutory bodies from 47 million to 58 million. That extra 11 million dollars would be able to ensure that the entire population can get the health care. Most importantly, there is more money spent on prisoners getting health care than dentistry in the school. The only reason why it's not possible is because the health authority was created not to provide the universal care, but as basically a form of political promotion. And the way to get it done is to ensure that I'm the Minister of Finance and the Minister of Health. Thanks. Next, we will hear from Mr. Hodge, Mr. Sutcliffe Hodge. I absolutely believe that universal health is achievable in five years. Many doctors in Anguilla would admit that Anguilla has one of the healthiest populations in the Caribbean. So we are off to a good start. I'm of the firm view that there's a need for us to zero in on primary care, preventative care. What does that look like? In my view, there is a need for us to do testing, testing of every citizen of this country at least once a year, if not twice a year. And a schedule should be set up where some primary checks are made. We need to have things identified early. So clearly, early detection is very important. But one of the things we also need to recognize that there's a direct relationship between good health, nutrition, good health and education. So to my mind, there's a need for us to have programs on radio on a regular basis, encouraging people to adopt healthy lifestyles. This doesn't cost too much. Programs of this nature should also happen in the schools. So if people know what foods are good and healthy, and they exercise, then a lot of the chronic diseases like diabetes is preventable. Some types of diseases which are based on certain foods that we eat, meats, et cetera, et cetera, can be prevented or diverted, or should I say, stalled, if we were to eat a healthy diet. So I think the primary thing is really primary care with a focus in on nutrition, exercise, education, and then there's a tertiary care. Tertiary care should not come as a surprise. In other words, early detection means that we can see the onset of a disease with a patient. 
So we don't need to have an air ambulance taking them out. They can probably go out on a regular aircraft, which does not cost as much. That is if it becomes necessary for the patient to be taken off island. So again, this would save a lot of money and that money in health can be used to expand our healthcare program and maybe help our people deal with some nutritional deficiencies. Again, early, early detection, early testing, nutrition, exercise, those are the things that's key to our healthy lifestyle. Thank you very much. Mr. Hodge, Mr. Kenneth Hodge, yes. you can go ahead. Thank you. Madam Moderator, when you examine SDG number three, which speaks to ensuring healthy lives and promoting well-being at all ages as essential to sustainable development, look at SDG number 10, where it says reducing inequalities and ensuring that no one is left behind is integral to achieving the sustainable development goals, and 11, where we talk about making cities and human settlements inclusive, safe, resilient, and sustainable. And that also speaks to the question of slum dwellers' inadequate and overburdened infrastructure and services. So I have raised those points to indicate to you tonight that we in Anguilla have to take a realistic look at the quality of healthcare that we provide in Anguilla today. My comrade Sutliff talked about the preventative care, and I support that as well, because we have to ensure that we put in place programs that reach out to our people across this island and ensure that they are exposed to the quality health care that they, they, they deserve. It goes as well to the question of our tax dollars. We pay taxes in this island. We have to begin to look at the sustainable use of our tax dollars. And I firmly believe that a portion of our tax dollars have to be realistically allocated to the question of providing health care. We have walked across the length and breadth of this island, and we have spoken especially to a lot of our senior citizens who are now beginning to manifest in all kinds of health conditions. And of course, they are showing you as you go around the very high um, medical bills that they are receiving. So my simple answer to that question would be, Madam Moderator, that as a government, we have to begin to allocate some of our tax dollars to providing this realistic health care, this universal health care. And I am firmly of the belief that within five years, that can be done. Yeah. Yeah. We will now hear from Mr. Vanterpool. Thank you, Madam Moderator. Madam Moderator, I want to agree that universal health care can be achieved in the next five years. We are aware that in Anguilla, we have seen quite a bit of non-communicable diseases. And uh, I think all of that starts with our diet and our lifestyle. Now, I know that what we have to do, we have to do a lot of research. Research to find out exactly what has been going on with our people. One of the things I want to submit very early as I speak about lifestyle, we often hear that we are what we eat. And to that end, we have to eat right if we want to live right. And uh, I want to propose, which I said in my opening statement, that we do as our forefathers did. We get back to the soil. We plant what we grow, and we grow what we eat. Eat what we grow and grow what we eat. I also want to propose that, and this was said already as well, that we involve ourselves with exercise. Not just sporadic, but meaningful exercise. We also have to have a meaningful education sessions at all levels on healthy eating. And uh, we also, especially in our school system, we need to be able to introduce healthy eating. 
We recognize that in schools, during breaks, we see all the snacks and the type of junk food. We need at some point to be able to direct our, our persons, whether children or whoever, into the importance of eating healthy and living he healthy. We also have to do health screening. And that should not be when we are old and feeling the effects, but especially when we are young. Because these health, um, health challenges manifest themselves from a very early stage. But because we are not aware, we continue to take them with, with us. So yes, I want to agree that we can achieve universal health care, but we have to start and work on it now. Everyone must be on board. Candidates will now be given two minutes to rebut or share further information, if so desired. Dr. Hobson, we may begin with you. The research that my scope master is looking for is right here. <laughs> to achieve anything, it depends on the quality of the personnel. And that's as I stated before, if they have read the National Health Fund Act, you need the Minister of Finance and the Minister of Health to work together in harmony. The information was given to the Ministers of Health and Finance, and the previous Minister of Finance was also the Minister of Health, Mr. Uh, Hubert Hughes. The reason why we don't have it is because they're not interested in you having it. But when it comes to themselves, the politicians always have the answers. For themselves, the answer is always yes, but for you, the answer is always an excuse. That's the reason why it depends on the quality of the individuals that you choose to elect. If you elect the same type of persons are only committed to the political parties, you'll get the same answer every time. You need individuals who actually read and do high quality research and have respect for education. But even though politicians may speak about education, they only mean it for a particular set of individuals and not for the country as a whole. This is the reason why we are emphasizing universal education, universal health, and a universal basic income, because as the scripture says, money is the answer to all things. Again, universal justice too is important, because many persons are end up being incarcerated for using a plant that can have many beneficial purposes, and that plant which was created in Genesis 1 is known as the marijuana plant or the weed plant. So that is the answer to the question. Thank you, Dr. Hobson. Mr. Sutcliffe-Hodge, you will now have an opportunity to rebut or share further information. Sure. Thank you very much. From the responses so far, I think we have all agreed that achieving universal health within five years is in fact possible. I want to add a couple of things though. I find it very disturbing that in Anguilla, patients pay duties on medication. We don't opt to get sick where we have to use medication. Why is it that duties is charged for medication? That is concerning. The other issue that I think that we need to address, there is a correlation between he good health and nutrition. Bad health and nutrition. In other words, poor people tend to not eat well and they get sick quite often. They're obese, they tend to be sick. One of the things I'd like to see happen in Angola, and I've been advocating this for many years, there's a need for there to be a basket of goods, a basket of goods for hygiene type products, basket of goods for foods. And those, that basket of goods will be identified by the health and nutrition personnel. Those goods come into Anguilla duty free, come into one of our major stores, and all stores will get those goods from that one store and they'll be sold at one low, cheap rate so that everybody in Anguilla can have access to good quality hygiene products inexpensively, good quality food 
inexpensively. And that will also help to reduce and eliminate poverty where, where poverty has a direct relationship with health. Thank you, Mr. Hodge. We are now here from Mr. Kenneth Hodge. Yes, one of the areas of concern for me has been the coverage for health care. It is very expensive in Angola to have health care coverage. And for a lot of us in Angola, particularly those who have retired, they have to pay basically an arm and a leg to get adequate health coverage. And this is something I believe we need to look at quite seriously in conjunction with our insurance companies to see if there's some way that we can drive these costs down. These insurance companies cover thousands of people in terms of their, their coverage. They make quite a lot of money from this coverage. And I believe that the time has come when we have to work with those insurance companies that we can at least offer our citizens better, lower rates, and by that, we can offer more people opportunities to be covered. When you go to the pharmacy and you see the, the, the kinds of, of bills that you have to pay, it's sometimes a real deterrent. So my point tonight is the insurance companies, we have to bring them on board in terms of reducing the high cost of the coverage of those premiums. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Hodge. Mr. Vanderpool, you may proceed. Thank you, Madam Moderator. As was said earlier by one of my colleagues, income is directly re related um, to health and health care. In Anguilla, we have, to, we have to pay special attention to the income of our individuals, especially our workers in the hospitality and other medium paying jobs. Because if persons are not earning salaries that are commensurate with the ability to live, then health is going to suffer. I know that the Minister of Health um, has been working on putting together a minimum wage, which I'm sure would come in the, the new term. But that wage I would like to see, as was said earlier, a living wage, a wage that persons can exist on, not just something you know, to barely get them along. They must be able to pay their bills. So I want to suggest that when we are returned to office, this would be one of the things I know that the minister said that um, she would be working on very early in a term, and I'm hoping that individuals will give us that, that chance so we can continue to work on your behalf and put those measures in place. Thank you, Mr. Van de Poel. The audience is reminded to please be respectful and silent when the candidates are speaking. Thank you. Thank you. We move on to the second question. Mental health issues related to substance abuse appear to be on the rise. Do you see the two as related and what steps can be taken to remedy these issues? SDG 1, 3, and 11. One more time. Mental health issues related to substance abuse appear to be on the rise. Do you see the two as related and what steps can be taken to remedy these issues? After a minute is given to prepare, we'll start with Mr. Sutcliffe Hodge. Okay, since you're ready, you can start, Mr. Hodge. This is an issue that has disturbed me for many years. As a young man going to school, I recall having to do an impromptu discussion on the whole issue of delinquent youth, especially delinquent black youth in America. There's a relationship between mental health, substance abuse, and perpetual poverty. We have a situation in Anguilla 
where many of our women head up homes without the support of a man, without the presence of a man. Many of our women unfortunately find themselves having to work two and three jobs to keep food on the table, to feed the children, to clothe them, to ensure that they go to school. As a consequence, many children end up having to raise themselves. And in the process of trying to raise themselves, they become the property of the street. They become caught up in a subculture and an underdeveloped mind that's exposed to drugs. Fries the brain. Many of us see children walking the street sometimes aimlessly after school hours, during school hours. Many of these children, unfortunately, sometimes go to school without food. No one to care for them. And when they go to secondary school, they're automatically placed in band four. And band four, there's a stigma associated with band four. You're nobody. You're going to amount to nothing. There is a direct correlation between mental health and substance abuse. And the time has come for us in Angola to fix it. Too many mothers are absent from home. Not just in Angola. It's a problem <clears throat> plaguing the poor all over the world, but especially black poor people around the world. And right here in Anguilla, I thought that this would never have happened in this country, but it does, because the extended family no longer exists. It's a real issue, and we cannot just pay lip service to it, because we can have this conversation. I have participated in discussions of this nature in Anguilla time and time again. Election after election, but it continues. The issue is not just increasing the pay. We've got to be realistic about it. We have got to address the problem as a fundamental issue. I will speak some more on that when I come back. Thank you, Mr. Hodge. We now hear from Mr. Kenneth Hodge. Yes, Mr. Moderator. That's a very interesting question there, but I would like to take it a step further. I agree that mental health issues are related to substance abuse, but I want to hone in, in particular, on our young people. And I want to remind the teachers in the room tonight of Maslow's hierarchy of needs. It talks about the basic needs, things as such as food, water, warmth, and rest, security, and safety. And I want to apply that to our young people this evening. As we walk to our communities and we see the number of young people that continue to hang out by the roadside because some of their homes, their, their parents may be having to work two and three jobs, nobody's home. They're looking for that companionship, that peer acceptance. And a lot of the time, sometimes to be a part of the group, they are resorting to substance, they are resorting to smoking, marijuana, or other illegal substances be part of the group. And a lot of the times, because they are taking these substances, mental health issues will arise. One of the other things that caught my attention was during this COVID pandemic, when so many of us were at home, basically on lockdown. Our school children were we looking at how those children were coping during that lockdown time away from class away from school, away from their friends, basically a very uncertain time, having to cope with a, a, a brand new online platform method of learning. And then they have to return to school to catch up. Teachers have been telling me a lot of these children are not coping well since they have come back to school. And there's great suspicions that they might have to bring in counselors to really evaluate these children to see if there are mental health issues that have, have arisen. So this COVID pandemic in particular, I believe, has really exacerbated some of these issues in our community. 
So we have to look at this question a little wider than substance abuse, and we have to look at even the issues caused by the COVID-19 pandemic and its effect upon our young children in particular as, as we have them returning to school and trying to cope in a basically a new environment after being locked down for so long. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Hutch. We now hear from Mr. Randepool. Thank you, Mr. Moderator. Mr. Moderator, I too want to agree with the, the topic, um, mental health issues related to substance abuse. <coughs> Mr. Moderator, over my many years of working with young people, I have seen individuals move or transcend from what I would say walk in the street and narrow into the area of substance abuse. And uh, on many occasions, I had cause to visit the parents' homes and sometimes to look at their associates. And uh, one of the things that I realize is that on a number of occasions, we might not be aware, but substance abuse goes on even in the children's parents' home, and they themselves don't even know. I think one of the things we need to do and do it early is to pay special attention to our young people. Special attention. Sometimes we look at them and we overlook the small signs. But those, those signs are there and we need to be able to pick them up and be able to try and from an early stage to remedy the situation. I want to suggest that counseling is done on a regular basis and uh, we must not take our children for granted. They may be in the room and playing and having fun, but then we need to understand exactly what is going on with them because if we continue on the trajectory that we are going, we can lose our children and lose a whole generation. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Randapool. We now hear from Dr. Hobson. Substance abuse can lead to mental health problems. So the order of the diagnosis needs to be correctly stated. And the number one drug that causes the most problems in Angola and the world is alcohol. So when we tax alcohol to debt, then we will have less abuse, both sexual and also physical, towards our women and our children. But when our children are taught, that Christopher Columbus, a murderer and a rapist, discovered this part of the world, as opposed to the fact that they came from Africa, which is the original continent. That's the reason why in the schools, they have not as much interest. We have to completely revolutionize and we are going to diversify education. The education system is geared towards the students only being slaves in the hell tale or the slave tale industry. And we can see the evidence of that Again, with the same scenario that happened in the case of Kenny Mitchell. The <clears throat> individuals who were his colleagues outnumbered Mr. Hapgood, but yet they still allow their colleague to die. The reason is they are mentally enslaved. And the only way you can deal with mental enslavement is electing persons like the general, who is proud to be black, because we know that God is black, just as Jesus was, just as the angels are, just as the universe is. And when you inculcate this mentality, into the students, they will be so high on that knowledge. They will be able to fly high off of our technological prowess that we had before we were colonized, raped, and brutalized. So the key is teaching proper history from preschool. In addition to teaching the languages, we wanted to be proud to be who they are. We want to be able to control everything in Angola as opposed to giving the rights over our bodies, over our black bodies, to those who are oppressive. So if you want to solve this problem, defunding or reducing the amount of money that's spent on incarceration, providing that money towards the healthcare and into a proper education, starting with the fact that we are Africans and we are not trying to be little England like they do in Barbados. And that's how come they end up with the third highest debt to GDP ratio in the world. We are aiming to be a republic. We are aiming to be free. 
and if 99.77 and 99.72 percent of Anguillans voted for that back in 67 and 69, that should be the goal. And if we teach this to our students, then we would not have a problem with substance abuse. Okay, thank you, Dr. Hobson. Now each candidate will be given two minutes to rebut or share further information on the topic. Mr. Hodge. Yes, thank you very much again. The issue of perpetual poverty, that is where parents cannot afford to take care of their children because they need to work two and three jobs. So a mother has got to work two and three jobs, abandons her children. I heard Mr. Van Poel and rightly say there is a need for there to be more money made available to workers so they can afford to take care of their children. I think there's a two-pronged approach. One of the things that I have been seeking to do throughout my political career is to lower the cost of living in this country to the benefit of everyone in, Ang in Anguilla. And some time ago, I spoke about a renewable energy-led economic transformation. If we can lower the cost, the price of electricity to everyone by 75 or 80%, if we can do that for the hotels, if we can lower the price of water for the hotels as well, we can then go to the hotels and say, now that you have realized these savings, you now need to pay some of our workers better. One of the issues that we have, there are no sporting outlets for our young people. We bluff them about a racetrack. We bluff them about a basketball court. We bluff them about a, a, a track, a running track, but nothing happens. It's time for us to act, and it's time for us to demonstrate real love and caring for our young people. You help a young person to feel good about themselves, you can get some positive results. A lot of very, very talented young people, their lives are wasted because we don't care. We don't look out for them. We have got to fix it and, and not just talk about it. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Hatch. Mr. Hatch. <laughs> Thank you very much, Mr. Moderator. I would like to suggest, Mr. Moderator, that we engage in a little more vigorous education campaign. We know that the police force has been engaging in a program in the schools. I would like to see that ramped up a lot more. I would like to even see it start even at a very young ages, even as far as preschool, because we have to begin to inculcate in our people the attitudes and the, 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 the knowledge that substance Drugs can be very harmful to one's body. And to me, the earlier we start this education program is the better. In terms of, the, of, of our, young, our young people in particular that are engaging in substance abuse, I believe a lot of them are looking more for role models or persons that they can turn to, those father figures that some of them really don't have. And I believe that we need to begin to raise up more role models in our community, people that, that our troubled young people in particular can look to for that guidance when they are having these issues. And my third point very quickly, in terms of what is available in terms of the resources locally that the persons can get that level of assistance they need, given the issues with confidentiality and mistrust of the system, what, what, what resources do we have in place to cater when we have these mental health issues arising. So those are the three things I believe we really, really need to look at moving forward. Thank you, Mr. Hodge. Mr. Brent, will you? Thank you, Mr. Moderator. Um, I listened to my learned colleague on the end, my schoolmate, Mr. Hodge, when he spoke about Maslow hierarchy of needs, and I thought that he was going there, but he, he stopped short. But if I should visit Maslow hierarchy of needs as it relates to human beings, the, the highest need of man is not based according to Maslow. It is not food. It is not water. 
but it is for self-actualization. And uh, our young people are looking to persons to make them feel good, to bring out the best in them. And I think that we need to be able to do that by loving them, getting to know them, getting them involved in the area of agriculture, if I should say that I spoke about earlier. But we need to get our young people more involved in hands-on activities, things that they can do for themselves and see things come into life. So I want to, to put out over there that self-actualization and one feeling good about themselves is one of the greatest needs of man, according to Maslow. We also need to be able to, as I said earlier, get them involved in meaningful activities. There are community groups, there are counseling groups, there are peer groups. But we have to get our young people involved. Because unless you feel good about yourself, then self-esteem is down. And you never feel like moving yourself up. You always feel like you're not as good as someone else. So I want to say, let us get our young people involved. Let us help them. And they themselves can pull themselves out of those type of dilemmas. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Rentpool. Dr. Hapson. Self-actualization is the highest order. And that's why we preach the message of dignity. And dignity can be achieved when they have the universal basic income so that our women who often are the heads of the households wouldn't have to be pimped out in order to make that extra money. So when the textbooks are free, that is one less burden on the parents. When they have the security of the healthcare, a next less burden on the parents. When the curriculum is completely revolutionized and the students can be seeing themselves as human beings who can be actualized as opposed to be dehumanized again in the slave tail industry. Now when we move in that direction, there wouldn't be any need for us to have to bring in the police force. As a matter of fact, we can reduce the police force because studies have also shown more cops, more drugs, because we know many times that the drugs are often planted on such young persons. Now, when we have a society where there is a focus on equality, then there wouldn't be any need to use chemical substances to get that particular high or to get that escape. Again, when we're speaking about the marijuana, we are not focusing on smoking. Because if you're a youngster, it can affect your memory and the oxygenic system. However, it is a plan. And if you're truly concerned about the health care of our youngsters, then Tylenol, which can damage your liver, should also be policed, but I don't think they will do that. So hence, let us focus on revitalizing, refocusing, and revolutionizing our educational system so that our students can be seen as dignified, self-actualized human beings. Thank you, Dr. Hobson. We will now go into question number three, and we will begin with Mr. Kenneth Hodge. Question three. What steps must Anguilla take to be able to thrive as a sustainable, independent territory? SDGs one, two, three, seven, eight, nine, 11, 12, and 16. I repeat. What steps must Angola take to be able to thrive as a sustainable, independent territory? SDGs 1, 2, 3, 7, 8, 9, 11, 12, and 16. Mr. Hodge, you can take a minute to prepare if required. Thank you.
audience is reminded to be quiet while the candidates are speaking. Mr. Hodge, you may thank, begin. Thank you very much, Madam Moderator. In the APM's vision, we speak about great societies are judged by the way it takes care of its very young and elderly. I propose to answer your questions in four main areas, your question in four main areas. First of all, we need to look very carefully at our education system. This has been the number one topic of discussion on this campaign this year. And we in APM have been championing the need for a thorough overhaul. Our education system has not been living up to the expectations. Our young people, some, most times up to 200 students, leave school every year, and a lot of them are falling through the cracks. So our education system must be overhauled. We have to look at our economy. The COVID-19 pandemic basically crashed our tourism industry. And if we are going to be moving towards a, a sustainable independent territory, then we have to begin to diversify and increase things like our small business sector, get our young people into entrepreneurship opportunities, and basically create those other niche industries that can allow us to, to live and thrive as an independent nation. And then we have to look at the question of health care. We, do we have the best quality of health care in Anguilla at this point in time? What do we need? Do we have a proper hospital? Do we have the proper facilities that we need to put in, have in place? These are the things that we have to look at in terms of our health care. Why are we having to fly out so many persons all the time? The high cost of health care. And then my fourth point quickly is the whole question of the elderly. These people that have contributed so much to our, our country in their formative years and in the twilight years, we have to begin to look at the quality of care we're providing them. Are we as well as the people utilizing the skill sets of our elderly? Are we taking them into our schools to begin to educate our young people about those oral traditions of so long ago? We are talking about independent, sustainable territory. These are the kinds of issues in my mind, these four issues that I believe are key if you want to really thrive as a sustainable, independent territory. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Hodge. We will now hear from Mr. Vantipool. Thank you, Madam Moderator. Madam Moderator, we have been hearing for decades about independence and um, Time and time, we always hear about it as it relates to whenever we get to elections time and everybody you're thinking about going independent and uh, independent and sustain, sustainable nation we are talking about. First of all, we have to look at education because we have to train up our persons. If we are going to have um, independence as our, our next step, we need to focus on training and education, training and retraining. It is important that we skill up our individuals and make sure that they can make meaningful contributions to Anguilla going forward. Food and food security. We have to be able to provide ourselves with at least a reasonable amount of good food. Food that is not chemicalized, food that is locally grown, food that is fresh. So I would think that we need to do a, quite a bit as it relates to our food security. We also need to look at our fishing and our fishing industry. We hear quite a bit about our 200 miles limit that we have in the north, but we have to not only talk about it, but we have to uh, get ourselves up and into that resource and use it sustainably. We have to build sustainable financial streams, basically diversif diversifying our economy and ensuring that um, the streams of revenue that we have coming in will not be coming from one, uh, our eggs will not be in one basket, but that we can supply ourselves as we go along. We must also invest in, <clears throat> sorry, renewable energy. That's a big buzzword these days. There's a lot that we can do as it relates to renewable energy, 
And that in itself will help to bring our, the cost of our running our systems in Anguilla to a minimum and would basically be able to, we can have some of that money that goes out for fuel can be put in our economy to help to fuel the other areas. For example, take care of our young persons, take care of the elderly, and help to educate as well. We are building new schools, and uh, I know that there's going to be need for quite a bit to make sure that our schools and institutions of learning function properly. So I'm going to say with all of these things, we need to put in place if we are going to think about having an independent society. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Hodge. Francis Thank you, Mr. Vanterpool. Dr. Hobson, we will now hear from you. Independence has everything to do with dignity and nothing to do with economy. The fact that Mr. Walter Hodge, who has a son that's running for election, a grandson who is doing this marvelous production, already tells me that when they were smart enough in 1967 to declare it a republic, we should respect those intelligent persons from District 1. The same district that has led the way in the revolution is not the one that is most marginalized from all of the economic topics that my good scope master just mentioned. If 51.8% of persons in the UK voted for Brexit and it was recognized, then it is very disrespectful to the legacy of Mr. Walter Hodge, to Mr. Athen Harrigan, who started the revolution in his mind. When you're insane in a membrane, you will think that independence hinges on money. Money was probably the reason why Kenya is not with us today. The goal must be about dignity, revolutionizing education, blowing it apart, and teaching persons about the same Mr. Walter Hodge. And interestingly enough, when I was on the radio speaking about him, some of the colleagues who may be in the same political party with Mr. Hodge wanted to cut off the mic from me speaking about it. So it has to do everything with this and less to do with that. But when it comes to making the money, we had already given those ideas already. When we put online the marijuana online registration network, same for our deep sea fishing licensing regime, sports fishing, having proper diversified tourism where Anguillians are also more integral into it, focusing on our past and moving it towards our history, our, uh, the future, it is indeed possible. So for me, it is already the case because I know Teacher Walter be, because he's the same gentleman who was a master shipbuilder who took my grandfather's boat, split it in half, and joined it together which was named after my grandmother. So we can and we should, and we should make that as the goal within one to two years for us to become again the Republic of Anguilla, which Mr. Walter Hodge read out in that declaration so beautifully, written by Roger Fisher from the USA, and our revolution was also supported by the Black Panthers. Thanks. Thank you, Dr. Hobson. We'll now hear from Mr. Sutcliffe Hodge. I believe that key, key and fundamental to achieving sustainable independence is to ensure that we eradicate the working poor from Angola. Many of our people are out there putting in the hours on the job but the money that they're making is not sufficient to survive on. We've got to address that. So we've got to lower the cost of living in Anguilla, and I keep harping on the need for us to move to using renewable energy, which is a key cost driver. That will lower the food prices in the store because the store pays low electricity, and because they pay low electricity, they can pass on lower food prices to you. Because electricity is used to process the seawater into water that you can bathe with and drink, Electri water prices goes down, electricity prices go down, <clears throat> all good and positive stuff. We need to 
zero in on tourism. Tourism is our business, but we have been paying lip service to tourism for many years. St. Martin next door, they get over two million tourists a year. We get excited when we have anything over 150,000 tourists a year. Less than 10% of the tourists that St. Martin gets. Why is that? It must have to do with a few key things. The word about Anguilla is not getting out. Anguilla is oftentimes viewed as an expensive destination. Let's lower the cost of living, lower the cost of doing business in Anguilla. Let's get the word out that Anguilla is paradise. And you know what we can do as Anguillans? We need to beautify and clean up Anguilla. I was asked a question today. Is Anguilla a five-star destination or Anguilla a destination with five-star properties? Anguilla is a destination with five-star properties. And we are kings and queens in Anguilla. We can make Anguilla beautiful for ourselves first. And when, you, when your house is beautiful and clean and you have wonderful furniture, you don't mind having your friends and neighbors come over. We want to do that for all of Anguilla. We've got to address the issue of fishing, where we're going with fishing. Um, we can sell fishing licenses, but we can also do some small uh, canneries in Anguilla. In other words, we catch the fish, we can the fish, and we can export that fish to other markets. We can do farming. I tried farming in the last couple of weeks. It's been disastrous, way too hot. So I believe that we've got to look at what I call vertical farming, where you do farming in a building like this, under the right conditions, and we can supply a lot of our vegetable needs for Anguilla, the hotels and restaurants. I will raise some other issues in my second go around. I thank you. Thank you, Mr. Hodge. Mr. Hodge, we'll hear from you now. Sorry? Maybe button. Yes, yes. I, I noted the interest uh, observation by my colleague at the end, Mr. Van der Poel. We spoke about the AUF um, with the refurbishment and the building of schools and other buildings. We are appreciative of that. We are appreciative of the fact that we are getting new buildings. But our concern basically is, is that same level of effort and concern being placed on the quality and the delivery of our education product? Is that really up to standard? I spoke about, in my opening remarks, about the whole need for our national development plan. And I want to go back again to that national development plan as being key under that plan. Everything focuses our flows under that plan. And to me, a national development plan and our education system is, are those, is, is those two key planks that are necessary if we are really serious about going into a sustainable, independent territory. Our national development plan, we have had several tries at it over the years. And I think it's, it's really time that we get serious and we develop that so that that can inform what we're going to do in the next 5, 10, 20, and 50 years. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Hodge. Mr. Vanderpool, you have the opportunity to rebut or share further comments. Thank you, Madam Moderator. And um, I note with um, interest the, the comment of my opponent on the other end about um, what's going on in the school. I would hope that, um, that he's not questioning the commitment of the teachers, because I know they work very hard. And I know that our teachers continue to work hard. And um, I would hope that he's really not questioning their commitment. But moderator, for the information, as I said earlier, one of the things that I would want to see us do as we continue to strive for an um, independent Anguilla is teaching of agriculture in school, agriculture as a science. I remember that um, when I went to school, we did agriculture. I got my um, investiture into agriculture and the school. But I want to see us do a bit more as, um, with agriculture as a science. Fishing in school, fishing technology in school as a subject. I'm not sure if fishing is done in school. Um, I remember I did some classes there some time ago, but I'm not sure. But if we're gonna, if we're gonna scale up our people to go into, into um, deep sea, then we need to be able to 
expose them at a very early age. Because if you have that exposure at an early age, then most likely you would come out to be a great fisherman like my colleague from Island Harbor. And as it relates to um, education as well, we have to continue to look at things like um, trade school. I know that the ACC is now um, completing their building and, uh, in the Farrington area. And I, I believe that um, the TVET programs and other programs will be taught there. So I think we are underway, but we have to continue because I would want to continue to say, education, education, we have to go that way. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Vanderpool. Dr. Hobson, you have the opportunity to rebut. Obliteration of the political parties will be the first step uh, that will make it happen. Because if individuals who are in the same political party as Mr. Hodge wanted to kick me off of the radio for defending him, the scripture states that we must honor our mother and father. So it shows to us that politics is all about uh, money, which probably was promised to the individual who begged me to be on the program. He has probably promised uh, a position maybe on Anglic, and hence this is a real reason why most of these individuals are interested in getting involved in politics. Politics should be about promoting the dignity of our persons. Politics should be being able to be proud of Ricky Earl, who was in my physics class. Politics should be telling the truth about Mr. Walter Hodge. Politics should be about being straightforward, and in that case, we are showing that dignity comes when you speak the truth. So if we want to actualize it, because in my mind it's already so, because I know his father, and since it's already in my mind, all we need now is for it to be formalized. And when I worked on the national health insurance, which was stopped by this uh, present uh, government, when I went into the governor's office, on my laptop was the Republic of Anguilla. So this shows to me that if I can respect his dad, and he is in a party with individuals who do not respect it, he should come up with that party, and he's a good Baptist, vote for me, and then we can go together to lead Anguilla upward, onward, and forward. I thank you. Thank you, Dr. Hobson. Persons are kindly reminded to make sure their cell phones are on silent and to be respectfully quiet while the candidates are speaking. Um, Mr. Hodge, you have the opportunity. Sure, thank you very much. I think one of the things that we've got to focus on if we're serious about sustainable independence, we have got to have a comprehensive plan on youth development. It saddens me that in a tiny little island that is 16 miles long, some of our youngsters in the east cannot go in the west. We don't hear many of our politicians talk about this, but we live in a tiny, tiny little community. And if we're serious about having a sustainable island called Anguilla, we gotta be able to get along. We gotta be able to love each other. There's some young people who cannot get a job in the hotels. They cannot take a job in the, in the hotels because if they go beyond a certain point, they might not get home. We've got to address that. Additionally, we need to attract inward investment. In order to attract inward investment, one of the things that we've got to do, we've got to make Anguilla attractive. Doing business in Anguilla is expensive. So we've got to lower the cost of doing business in Anguilla. We can build out financial services, find a niche. We were, some time ago, we were talking about the captive insurance business. It seemed to have fallen by the wayside. We've got to take that up, dust it off. One of the things that is critical to Anguilla moving forward, we need unity in this country. We have one group fighting against another group. The youngsters can't go to the west. The West guys can't come to the East. Those guys in the yellow shirts are, are unhappy with the guys in the blue shirts. We are one small island community. I am sure that I am related to just about everybody in this room. We need to get along. We need to unite. So
So in order for us to achieve sustainable independence, we need to come together as an Angola family, as an Angola people. Not East and West, not Yellow Shirt and Blue Shirt, Anguillans. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Hodge. We move right along to the last question from the Angola National Youth Council. The virtual as well as live audience, you are reminded that you can send your questions to our email at axayouthcouncil at gmail.com. So the last question reads, domestic issues as well as violent crimes appear to be occurring more prevalently. What do you see as skills and attributes that Anguillians need to develop in order to ensure a humane and harmonious society? SDG 11 and 16. One more time. Domestic issues, as well as violent crimes, appear to be occurring more prevalently. What do you see as skills and attributes that Anguillians need to develop in order to ensure a humane and harmonious society? SDG 11 and 16. After a minute is given to prepare, we start with Mr. Vanderpool. Mr. Vanderpool. Thank you, Mr. Moderator. Mr. Moderator, I want to agree with the statement that um, domestic crimes appear to be on the uprise. And uh, I truly, truly believe that it is time that we as a people and one of the things I think that we need to do up front is to start to respect ourselves and respect others. Too often, we take people for granted. We think that we are masters over everybody else and not realizing that others have rights as well. So, as I said before, respect for oneself and for others. We have to understand as well that laws are in place for a reason. They are not there because somebody wants to put them on the books. And we must have respect for laws. We must also be tolerant. The level of intolerance in Anguilla and around these islands, it is, it is alarming. We must understand that we must all be able to coexist in this little space. But yes, we have freedom of speech, we have freedom of movement, but we have to understand that your freedom of speech must not infringe my freedoms as well. Another thing we need to, to do, or uh, to be mindful of, is that we need to trust each other. Again, the level of trust is way down. We need to be able once again to trust each other. My word should be my bond. Your word should be your bond. It is not that way. But we need to get back to that place where we can live harmoniously with each other, and we need to be honest. Honest with ourselves and with others. Too many, too, too many times we, we hear of all the, the WhatsApps and the Facebook posts and all those type of things that are going around, destroying people's character. And the thing about it, on most occasions, we know that most of these things might not be even true. It might be somebody's opinion, 
but we take it out there and we try to destroy others. And we are not honest with it because a lot of times we know that it is not true. I implore us to let us be civil, have some respect for ourselves and respect for others and respect the law as we go forward. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Vanderpool. Dr. Hobson. We need more Bible and less police. <laughs> Laws, as the scripture says, where there is no law, there is no sin. So many of these so-called crimes may be public, committed by the same officers who are mainly not from Angola. Again, this leads to a situation of a dividing rule. This is not by coincidence. This is exactly what the governor's office and those who are in charge want. They want us to no longer be policed by the five police officers that we had during the revolution, when no person died. The only thing the police officer did was basically correct women who were cursing each other using the F word. We can get back to that level of respect and dignity when we remember heroes like Mr. and Mistress Ashby, when we remember the heroes like Mr. Walter Hodge and also Mr. Ethan Harrigan, who began the revolution in his mind. This comes from renewing your mind. So that's why the scripture states that we must be transformed due to the renewal of our mind. The things that the people go to jail for are basically things that are carnal. But if we look above where Christ is risen, we should seek those things that are above, then we wouldn't have to have persons who themselves are criminals basically looking out at us. Now, when we bring that back into school, because as we stated before, we come in to revolutionize the education. That means complete obliteration to the present system, which is very carnal and to serve only the purpose of the colonizer, where your children are basically trained only to become subservient in the hotels. We are saying that they become planters, just like how Adam was in the garden, dressing the garden, and in that garden, when the plants were made, all of the plants, God said, were good. So when we focus on moral and not law, Ten Commandments, and that's why, too, we want to eliminate the majority of the laws that we have on our books, lower the bonds that are charged to our poor who are basically picked on because they might have a nice car, or the parents might have a big house, and these individuals who do not bring any value to our country, they are hired. We need to have more Sherlock Holmes, and let's say these cowboys with a cowboy looking uniform, save the money from the Robocops, put on bulletproof vests during primary school sports, which should be a holiday, by the way, and bring back Red House, B House, Blue House, and C House, so that there is more integration between Mr. Arthur Van Der Poel, who was back in those days of A, B, and C, and our children who now have the five houses. And when we have that harmony, and the fact that we are on this tiny rock, and we're only passing through, and then the maggots will come and eat us in a way, no matter how pretty you are, you still are gonna end up in the same place. When you get that into your brain, then we will have less problems, and we'll eliminate yellow and blue, because yellow and blue makes green, and green is for envy, envy too is a sin. Thank you, Dr. Hobson. <laughs> okay, guys. <laughs> Thank you, Dr. Hobson. We will now hear res the response from Mr. Hodge. You know, I, I cannot top that. I really... <laughs> Okay, all right. Yeah. Now, I hope that you've reset the clock. <laughs> Thank you. You might have to reset the clock again. <laughs> and again. Leadership. Leadership sets the tone for how people behave. Love sets the tone for how people behave. Poverty leads to anger and frustration. 
We need to lower the political partisan rhetoric year round. There are people who don't like me because I don't wear a yellow shirt or a blue shirt. We need to lower the political temperature in Angola. Very important. The issue of conflict resolution. How do we deal with conflict? How do we deal with conflict in the home? How do we deal with conflict in school? How do we deal with conflict in the church? We need to go back to church. Unfortunately, the church is getting empty of young people. If we want to lower the violent crime in our society, our children need to be grounded in Christian values. I believe Dr. Hobson alluded to that. We need more family time. Hug your children, love your children, especially your boys. Communities need to interact a lot more. We can do better. I'm not just talking about this because we are here in a discussion. These are some of my fun fundamental beliefs. We can do better. There's a need for greater transparency in our country. Many people believe that the activities and the affairs of our country are not transparent. It frustrates people. There is a need for checks and balances. Yes, checks and balances in our society so that we know that things are being done right and proper in our society. The tone, the tone needs to be set. An environment needs to be created where we all feel loved, respected, and appreciated. Oftentimes, violence in the home tend to be as a result of somebody snapping. And a lot of times, their snapping has nothing to do with anything that's going on in the home. It's usually a frustration that's happening outside of the home. We need support systems for people who are undergoing stress but oftentimes, we ignore the cries for help from our neighbors, from our friends, from our colleagues at work, etc. This all speaks to love. Two great commandments God has handed down to us. Love for each other. Love for our fellow man. If we manifest these qualities, we will have a wonderful society. I look forward to that day. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Sutcliffe Hodge. You now hear from Mr. Kenneth Hodge. Mr. Moderator, thank you. For many years, I served as the Principal Assistant Secretary in the Ministry of Home Affairs, and one of my duties was gender affairs. And so I have a personal connection with this topic tonight, because with gender affairs, these were the issues, these domestic issues where people were coming in to report domestic abuse to us, you know, asking us for help. And so I can connect with that. And one of the things that we did back then, we, 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 it took us about two years to get a gender development coordinator put in place. And I'm very proud of the fact that that was put in place. It is now down in the Department of Social, the Ministry of Social Development. But one of the things we did was a lot of training. We trained police officers, we trained NGOs, we, went, we trained church groups. We even identified um, what we would call marginalized communities. There were situations where we found a lot of expatriate um, women in Anguilla um, in relationships. They did not have any family support bases. A lot of them were not working. They had to depend on the man for support. And a lot of this abuse was happening because of that. And so one of the things we also did was to begin to train, develop skills, young women how to sew, how to bake, you know, give them skills. Because we, we, we found out quite early that a lot of this abuse occurred because 
The persons had no financial base. They had no means of supporting themselves financially, and so they had to depend on, in most cases, the man who, because he felt he was providing the money in the family, that he could abuse the woman as he felt like, right? And in terms of the last part of that question, the access to justice. So women who are in abusive situations, who do they go to, who do they turn to? A lot of the times, um, legal aid, justice is expensive. And so we need to consider moving forward as well, whether it be a pro bono or, or whether it be some system that can allow persons to access the legal system without a high cost of, of, the, of, of, of fees to pay. So I'm very happy that I was able to play a pivotal role in that whole development of that gender and development unit, and we have somebody in place now that is carrying on that work, and it is really, really a joy to my heart to see the work that is happening in that area. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Hutch. Mr. Ventable, you now have two minutes to rebut or uh, add further information. Thank you, Mr. Moderator. Just to add a bit of further information, I am glad to hear that the, you know, the work that has been done in the gender unit, because um, my years when I work as a social worker in the Department of Social Welfare, we were not fortunate to have such um, institutions in place. And uh, we had to do a lot of work in that area. So I'm glad that we are moving forward in that respect. Now, COVID-19 has demonstrated to, to us that um, when you are locked down and you're not active, you can become very irritable. Individuals can get on each other's nerves. You know, as I said before, persons can become um, very intolerant. And I would want to suggest that um, because we are in a situation where we are all together, we are all in this, we all are short on money. We are short on a lot of things. Maybe we have to take some time out, step back, and let us engage ourselves in activities, jollifications. We might have to help each other. Persons might not have, have the means to purchase, might not have the means to build. We might have some time and hand. Let us get together and help each other. We did it before, we can do it again. Um, and that is one of the reasons why in the Welch's community, we decide to, some years ago, some 12 years ago, and continuing, to start the Welch's Village Fest, where persons can come together and understand that we can work together. And I want to say that this is something that we can emulate in other areas, because working together, we help each other. We don't have the financial means. Let us go out there, give what we have, socialize, and at the end of the day, we can all, as Mr. Hart say, calm down, calm down, take a deep breath, and we can all move on together. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Renderpool. Dr. Hobson. People should tune into my Facebook lives when we bark out scripture. We don't bark like dogs. We use the Bible as the hammer and the fire. You like to beat up women, we use that same Bible to beat you over your head to get it in your brain that without women there will be no men. We already have equality because it's stated in Genesis 1. We must go back to Bible because it is fundamental and is available to us, unlike the laws which are mostly hidden. Every time individuals have to go towards the legal system and try to defend themselves, the laws are sometimes on the internet and other times they disappear. But the law of God is here within us and also in nature, and we should look towards that to be our guide. Would you want another individual to be beating you over the head? Well, the answer to that, as I stated, is when you listen to what the actual message is, including the fact about the music, get on your dancing shoes, get your exercise on, less beating, more dancing, tune into the Facebook Live. Most of the time it's done spontaneously. But whenever you tune in, at least you'll be learning something, and not for the screenshots, to put on fake accounts. Because that type of politics will never do anything for the culture, but make people more violent, more aggressive, and have multiple personality disorder, less multiple personality disorder. When you tune in, it depends on what's in your mind. That is what you're going to see. But what we are doing there is showing people, 
you may be struggling with anxiety and depression, our Facebook lives are there to help to cure it. Thanks. Thank you, Dr. Hobson. Mr. Hodge? No, I have nothing, nothing else. Okay, sure. The next Mr. Hodge. Yes, I just want to reach out, wear my gender hat, to reach out to our women and men, and to tell our young girls in particular that just because you may see your mother being abused, it doesn't mean that you have to grow up to accept a life of abuse as well. That is not normal for a man to abuse a woman. And I want to reach out to our young men as well to let them know, because your father put a few drinks in the system and beat up his wife, it doesn't mean that you have to grow up as well now to think that that's the only way to treat a woman. These are the kinds of messages that we have to send to our young people as they grow up to let them know that some things are just not acceptable. And this is why we have to reach out to our churches, our schools, our teachers, when they see the children acting up in school, you know, to find out what's happening and get the help that is so necessary. Because this domestic abuse affects not only the man and the woman, it affects the children, it affects families. I mean, it, it is really, really a terrible situation in this country. And I think we have to begin to be a little more aggressive in dealing with these issues if we really are going to be um, dealing properly with the issues of domestic crime and, 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 and so forth in our country. Thank you so much. Thank you, Mr. Hodge. So that now ends our segment with the questions from the ANYC on the Sustainable Development Goals. We will now field questions from our virtual and live audience. Candidates will have two minutes to respond and one minute to rebut or share further information, if so desired. Our first question from the audience. What actions would you take to address repaying our debt and avoiding future debt? I'll repeat. What actions would you take to address repaying our debt and to avoid future debt? We will begin with Dr. Hobson. You can have one minute to prepare if so desired. We, can, we need to follow the amortization schedule, which has already been written out in the medium term economic and fiscal program. Most of the debt belongs to Angola itself, so basically we are repaying ourselves. Approximately 58% of that debt uh, belongs to us in the form of Social Security, and the remaining 42% is to the CDB. So since we have gotten the additional $100 million of grant, it means that we will not have a problem in repaying this uh, loan. The only problem in terms of having the debt is that the interest that we are using to pay for other people's mistake, that $19.1 million that we're going to pay on the interest, we should take a good chunk of it and use it towards the poverty alleviation now. We want to put into the pockets, or we should put into the pockets of the population that is unemployed, that $2,500, because money really and truly is just paper and is only a means of exchange. So by 2027, we will be able to reach to the goals that were outlined between the UK government and the Angola government in 2014 also 2016, the framework for fiscal uh, responsibility. And currently now we are 203% for the debt to revenue ratio. We'll be back in line to 80%, and that will take place approximately in seven years. So there's no need necessarily to have to try to uh, ramp up the payments, but rather take the interest that can be lost and try to reclaim the $17.8 million that was foolishly given away in a capsule deal to allow that money too to circulate into the economy. Thanks. Thank you, Dr. Hobson. We will now hear from Mr. Sattaf Hodge. I'm of the firm view that the current debt that Angola is carrying in the current economic environment makes 
makes the whole thing unsustainable. To this end, I have been advocating for several weeks now, if not several months, that there is a real opportunity for Anguilla to borrow as much as one billion EC dollars at a rate anywhere between 0% and 1% from the IMF or the World Bank with the support and backing of the British government. Currently, our average interest rate on the monies owed is around 6%, $600 million at 6%. If we can borrow a billion dollars at anywhere between 0 and 1%, the payment on that over a 20-year period is lower than the payment that we are making today on $600 million. In other words, when the interest rate is extremely low, your repayment is also low. So if we can pay back at a rate of 0 to 1% on a billion dollars, it means that we can pay off our $600 million and we have $400 million to use for Angular's development. I will use that money in moving us to renewable energy and to get the farming sector up and running. With the savings that we would realize by the reduced rate of electricity, we can use some of those savings to service that debt. And that financial burden with all the high taxes that we have today, a lot of those taxes can be eliminated. You are taxed to death to pay off $600 million. I'm saying that if we borrow that money, $1 billion, at between 0 and 1% with the support and backing of the British government, we will have money at our disposal to move us on a path to sustainable development and service that debt from the revenues from renewable energy. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Hodge. Um, we will now hear from Mr. Kenneth Hodge. You know, it's so refreshing that two minds can agree on the same issue. I've been talking for a number of weeks with my colleague, Courtney, who is a banker, and this very same idea came up where we could get a loan from the World Bank at about zero point something of a percent or less and consolidate bring our loan portfolio under control because next year a lot of these loans become due. And also use some of that money to begin to do some capital development in Angola. Our roads are really in a bad condition. And we use some of that money to create a safety net, a safety cushion, or, 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 or really to help our people through these trying times. This COVID-19 is gonna be wrong with us for quite a while. And we have to ensure that we can sustain ourselves as a people for the next six months, at least a year. So that point about a billion dollars is something that we too in the APM, myself and Court in particular, have been really, really tossing around as a solution to really allow us to breathe. Right now, it's like Angola is choking, you know? Um, and we, we spoke about that hundred and something million dollars that the government has just gotten, you know? But my concern is the conditions under which this money has been granted. They are really, really horrendous conditions. Um, I realize my time is up, but, you know, but that billion dollars, I think, is really a solution to us at this point in time in our history. Thank you, Mr. Hodge. We'll now hear from Mr. Vanderpool. Thank you, Madam Moderator. Madam Mar Moderator, we are carrying a heavy debt burden. We are carrying a heavy debt burden. And most of that debt that we are carrying is in relation to the resolution of our banking sector. Now, the banks did not fail because they had money. People borrowed money from our banks and refused to pay. My thing is, I don't see why, we always talk about the little old lady down the street. 
The little old lady down the street who had $100,000, she had to pay. She paid hers. There are persons moving around with hundreds of millions of dollars among them, and I believe that they too must pay their share. Because to whom much is given, much is expected. The banks gave you money, and I think that individuals need to pay it back. Now, once that money is paid, once that money continues to come into the bank, what can happen is that our money that we are paying, are putting in there, can be returned to the government, and other things can be done with it. But I want to make it emphatically clear that we cannot allow a burden to be place on the taxpayers, because we are paying tax to cover this bill every day. I believe that those persons must pay that money. And we as a people should not allow them to get away with it, because if you do it once, you will do it twice. That money must be paid back. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Vanderpool. We will now give candidates an opportunity to rebut or share further information. One minute. Dr. Hobson, we'll begin with you. The banking report uh, should be released because, as my good scope manager correctly stated, we are the ones who are paying back this debt. The individuals who would have caused the failure, whether as managers or directors or the auditors, they need to be held to account because 26 more years before it is completely paid off. But while our future generation is paying this debt, our roads are still in the same deplorable uh, condition. But when it comes to the billion dollars, that should be at least a billion dollars in reparation. It should not be a loan. Because the bodies of our black female slaves and male slaves, which are also buck breaked by the colonizer, those ancestors' bodies became the basis of the loans and collaterals for the banks, including the Barclays Bank, and for the wealth that was accrued unto David Cameron, the Prime Minister of the United Kingdom. So that $100 million is a good start. It's a grant. It needs to be $900 million more extra, but without us having to repay it and without us having to borrow it. Thank you very much, Dr. Hobson. We will now hear from Mr. Hodge, if so desired. I believe that one of the things that makes the running of government complicated is that government wants to manage the economy. I think that government needs to step aside and allow the private sector to work. There is a need for light regulation. And if you want to see Angola thrive, politicians, and the bureaucracy in government needs to be set aside and energize the private sector to push the economy forward. I also firmly believe that we need to move to zero-based budgeting. Zero-based budgeting says that every year, as you prepare your budget, you start out with a blank sheet of paper. And you cost justify every service that you're providing, recognizing that that poor little old lady who walks in the hot sun to go to the bank to take off her $300 to pay her property tax, that's a painful thing for her to do. When you say every year, let's just add 2% to the budget, 3% to the budget, that's unacceptable. Zero-based budgeting is where we need to go, and we gotta cost justify every dollar spent in this country, checks and balances. Thank you, Mr. Hodge. Mr. Hodge, you have one minute, if so desired. Yes, the general said a good word, release the resolution, bring us information. I think we all need to know exactly what is the details of that banking resolution. But very real, my people, we have to practice fiscal responsibility. This COVID pandemic caught us with our pants down. Our coffers were empty. As a government, we have to ensure that we build and continue to build reserves, that when these kinds of catastrophic events happen, at least we have something of a, a cushion that we can exist on at least for two or three months until it gets ourselves. 
We can't be going cap in hand to the British government every time something like this happens. We have to begin to practice fiscal responsibility ourselves and begin to build those reserves. And without three months, three months may not be enough now. We may even have to think in terms of a year of reserves so that at least we can take care of our people when these events happen. Thank you, Mr. Hodge. Um, Mr. Ventpool, you have an opportunity if you desire. Thank you, Madam Moderator. Madam Moderator, I heard one of my colleagues mention $17 million for Cap Juluca that was um, deferred, uh, not paid in the government treasury. But l Madam Moderator, let me give some information on that. During the 2010 to 2015 AUM government, the monies that we are talking about here for Cap Juluca was paid into the government's treasury. Was paid into the government's treasury. And our government of 2010 to 2015 refused to cash those checks. Now, this is something you would have heard about. We talk about that for many years. Refused to cash Cap Juluca's checks. Cap Juluca decided, if you're not cashing my checks, they expired, I am not going to pay it. The present government came in, Cap Juluca had to be fixed. And we were not going to allow $17 million EC to stand in the way. That money was written off because we won't get in it anyway. Because that was written off, the new owners spent over 130 million US dollars to upgrade Cap Juluca. Lots of that money went to the Anguillan economy. Thank you very much. OK. Um, thank you very much, Mr. Van Der Poel, for your response. As we know, today is the final debate, so before we have the closing statements, I'd like to highlight one more time our sponsors. Um, I would like for the crowd to actually give them a round of applause as well. The government of Angola. <laughs> Flo. Aronel. Titanium Audiovisual, <laughs> Ashley and Sons, and lastly, but by no means least, Pink Mako. Okay, so we begin with our closing statements, and we'll start with Mr. Sutcliffe Hodge. You have three minutes, everyone, to give your closing statement. We have now come. come to the end of a long series of debates. You, the listening voters, have had an opportunity to see, or, to see all, or should I say, most of us present some of our sustainable development plans. From these discussions, many good ideas were brought to the fore. As, vulnerable developing island, as, a, as a vulnerable developing island, we have many opportunities to take advantage of, but we must act now. We must act as a united people. After all, it has to be about our island, Anguilla, and about all of us. We are out to build a new Anguilla. We band of pioneers. Let me, however, say, that there are many headwinds that we're going to have to face. But we have to turn these headwinds into real opportunities. There are some key challenges that we have to overcome, but overcome them together. We have to lower the cost of living with renewable energy-led economic transformation that will see the price of electricity reduce significantly. This will have the effect of lowering the price of water lowering the price of food in the grocery stores, significantly lowering the price of water for farmers, significantly lowering the price of electricity and water to the hotel sector, and by so doing, we can put our hotels in a position to pay their workers better. We must ensure that all of our people can have an income that is sufficient to live on, a living wage. Government services has to be delivered in a more efficient way, recognizing that we are all consumers, and as consumers, 
efficiency and professional service is important. Anguilla and Anguillans the world over, Anguilla and Anguillans, the world is our oyster. Let us face our challenges head on and turn each challenge into an opportunity that seeks to deliver a better way of life for all of the people in a sustainable way. To this end, we should strive to enhance our island sustainably. To deliver this brave new Anguilla, we need a brave, courageous team of leaders. You as a voter now have to greet all of us and select a team of 11 persons from among all of us and chart a new way forward for all Anguillans and every person living in Anguilla. I appeal to you tonight to select me as one of your four at-large candidates. Yes, no matter where you live in Anguilla, as long as you are a registered voter, you can vote for me, Sutcliffe Hodge. So on election day, look for that beautiful dove, brown dove, shade in that circle next to the dove. I commit to you, I will make you proud. I will make Anguilla proud. May God bless you, may God bless all of us, and may God bless Anguilla. Thank you, Mr. Hutch. We now hear from Mr. Kenneth Hutch. Thank you, Mr. Moderator. And so I will end as I began. I speak on my own behalf and certainly on behalf of the entire Anguilla Progressive Movement team when I say we are most grateful for the opportunity provided to speak to the SDGs, which as we have seen throughout these debates, form the bedrock for the future of Anguilla and its people. This new Anguilla, which we continue to hold aloft as our ideal, must necessarily be built with strength and endurance and foundations of truth and right. This is where we as leaders and servants have found ourselves in this moment. A reflection on truth and right and justice must undergird any decision of national importance that we will make. Indeed, Lowell's hymn, which I quoted in my opening statement, continues, then to side with truth is noble, when we share her wretched crust, ere her cause brings fame and profit, and is prosperous to be just. During the long campaign and evening listening to arguments from several perspectives and ideological positions off the trail, we all must agree on a singular fact. We have to be more urgent about actually getting things done. This is time for action. We have been reminded by the refreshing and energetic re-engagement of the electorate here in Anguilla. Our main focus, as we have been reminded, is to get things done, things that will benefit and advance people and nation in the short, medium, and the long term. I'm convinced further, Mr. Moderator, that the Anguilla Progressive Movement, led by Dr. Ellis Lorenzo Webster, is the right team for the challenge at this time. Change can't wait. We in the APM have already identified a number of areas of national importance that even with limited resources and a challenging global landscape, we can start to surmount. Indeed, the issues which plague our children's education and its delivery, conflict resolution, emotional, mental, physical health, food security, hunger, among others, should not be made to wait any longer. Change in these or any other areas cannot wait. It is said that the real success of any nation is dependent on the treatment of the young and the elderly, the vulnerable among us. This is not just a popular catchphrase, it is the truth. As an island-wide candidate with the Anguilla Progressive Movement, I promise that if given the opportunity to serve in this new capacity, I will give my wholehearted forward focus to help make Anguilla mighty 
and prosper us again. Let truth and right her banner be, we'll march ever on. I thank you. Thank you, Mr. Hutch. We now hear from Mr. Ventipool. Thank you, Mr. Moderator. Mr. Moderator, I want to say thanks to the Anglo National Youth Council once again for affording us this opportunity to air our views on the various topics. And I'm going to say to the audience here and those listening, as you make your final decision to cast your vote, I ask you to consider a few things. I ask you to consider a party that kept you safe, especially during this pandemic. I ask you to consider... Okay, wait, Mr. Vanderbilt. Okay, I ask the audience to be respectful of Mr. Vanderbilt. Let him finish. You may continue. I think that was what I was speaking about earlier when I spoke about disrespect. You know, we need to be more respectful. Let me start over. Not to start right over, but I'm going to start from the area where I'm asking you to consider, to consider a party that kept you safe during this pandemic. I'm asking you to consider a party that worked on your behalf and provided water, which is now running 24-7. I ask you to consider a government that in its banking resolution save 100% of all our deposits in here. I ask you to consider that. Consider a party, a government, that is working for the people of Anguilla. And I'm asking you to consider a party that is heavily involved in the reconstruction of our infrastructure island-wide. And I'm asking you to consider a party that has been looking out for you, the people of Anguilla. I want to say a word to our persons in the National Commercial Bank of Anguilla. I know you have your concerns. It is a long time. You have been waiting. But I want to assure you that when elected, I will personally be work, continue to work on your behalf because I have skin in this game as well. So you will have someone at the executive council level to champion your cause. I also want you, I also want you, when you go to vote, make the correct choice. I want you to vote for Artland Vanterpool and the Anglo United Front. I was elected before. I serve my people with dignity. I am prepared to do it again. And I want to say to you, in my last 30 seconds, if there's ever a time that Anguilla needs continuity, it's now. Thank you very much. OK, thank you, Mr. Vanderpool. We now hear the closing statement of Dr. Hobson. Saving the best for less. And you can see the level of collegiality between my scoutmaster and myself. This is the type of campaigning we need. We spent our zero dollars and people came along on their own, showing social democracy. No fake ads, no fake accounts, no slander, no betrayal and disrespect of Mr. Walter Hodge legacy so that persons on a radio station who begged me to be on it, after they got the ratings up, decided to stab. This is the type of policy that we come to obliterate. And I know that my skulk master who taught me those 10 skulk laws will agree that he too for sure will definitely vote with me, as will his nephew, Mr. Vanterpool, because we want the best to be in the House of Assembly. No fake poll that was produced suddenly is going to change the fact that this is a winner of the debate here. And also on Monday, it will be the same. So on Saturday, you can come on out 
when we have our rally. Two rallies, one man, zero dollars, two, one, zero. And I know for sure that Mr. Vanderpool is proud of his scout, and he knows that when you are honest, you are coming here prepared, and that's why I didn't have to refer to any notes, because already up in here, God chose me for this from before the foundation of the earth, and there's nothing anyone can do to stop it. I thank you. Okay. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Hobson. That brings us to the end of the debate for the night. I would like, okay. I would like to again thank our sponsors: the Government of Angola, Flo, Ironel, Titanium Audiovisual, Johnson's Delivery Services, Pink Mako, as well as Ashley and Sons. I would like to also thank all of the candidates for supporting the Angola National Council. Do have a pleasant night.